excuse for having a nice and, and mainly because he doesn't he doesn't have socks on. <laughs> and, uh, but it, will be, it will be fifty some degrees today. Yeah. All right. So I think we've we've got the intros. What we wanted to do, if you had, if I missed you, please um, speak up. But uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to go sort of top down, and and I I always enjoyed having the ARS you know outlook perspective, and now they've got they've added Papyrus, which has a tech. Um, focus. So that'd be nice if you could sort of set the stage for the discussion that and what you're seeing, because what we've seen different winds, right? Is has been this a lot of babies maybe being flown out, thrown out with the bathwater. It's really a flight to cash flow, and um, and uh, so some some have taken a hit. I'm curious what that means for Series E all the way down. Um, but if you could set that stage for us, then I'll let you, uh, if you want to share your screen. Of course. And uh, there we go. Um, so I guess the best way, I know I know we've, we've sort of talked about a couple of these issues in the past with, um, you know, a lot of the people here. So I guess, hold on, let me just share my screen and then I'll uh, talk to it. Um, so what I would say is that I was last week, um, you know, I was in Denver uh, meeting with uh, the management team at Liberty. So, you know, that's John Malone, uh, Greg Maffei, uh, Mike Freeze, who runs Liberty Global, and Paul Nair, who runs Liberty Latin America. And so I think a lot of the discussion was around, especially with Dr. Malone on the economic side, was really around just sort of how the market's changing, uh, the public markets especially. Um, you know, inflation is here to stay. It might not be 6%. You know, Stephen can tell you much more about this than I can, but it might not be 6%, but maybe it's 3 to 4%. And we've sort of seen a move in, you know, the 10-year Treasury up because of that. So the question is, you know, how do you invest in the public markets accordingly? And, you know, I think one, what we've sort of realized is it's sort of a two-fold barbell approach, right? We have a positive view on the cloud uh, through a couple of our ARS strategies, you know, we're invested in, you know, Google, Microsoft, Amazon. Um, and so we think that those are obviously the businesses that are quality, uh, they have real barriers to entry, and the number of workloads going into the cloud is still sort of increasing or accelerating. And so we think the free cash flow to those businesses and the growth that you're getting through them um, is sort of here to stay. You know, they all put up somewhere between 37 and 45% or 53%, I think, for Google Cloud um, growth, revenue growth. And so we think, you know, paying 12, 15 times EBITDA for these sort of stable quality revenue streams still makes sense even here. Um, and then on the other side, sort of the other end of the barbell, what we're trying to do is we're really trying to find the businesses, like Mark said, that have real free cash flow. Um, you know, one of the, the things that Greg Maffei said was, you know, you're, just, you're basically trying to, to, to pull the hype out. And so there are so many businesses in the last, um, you know, couple of years that have really, you know, SPACs especially, right, and some of the businesses they've acquired have just been, you know, uh, businesses that haven't generated real ROIs. And I think our goal is really finding the businesses that we think are kind of off the beaten path uh, and have... Um, you know, kind of great ROI characteristics because they have real technology, they have real management teams, and when we sort of underwrite where we're buying the stock today, um, you know, we think we can we can make multiples of returns uh, into the future because these aren't well-known businesses. Um, so again, back to the Liberty meetings, you know, when we were talking about, you know, broadband growth, um, clearly with 4K, 8K video, the numbers you're seeing out of the cable companies of what consumers are consuming in the home is uh, pretty astounding, right? And I think COVID excelling, we all know COVID accelerated that. Uh, and so um, the the thing that Dr. Malone was saying was that, you know, you, said, you still have to think about technology obsolescence. Uh, and he mentioned LEO satellites by name, and I know it's a discussion we've had uh, in one of Mark's um, you know, Tuesday meetings, but, um, you know, we're invested in the company that uh, they have sort of a legacy satellite fleet uh, that's declining about 5% a year, but we're buying the business at $24, and that legacy satellite fleet is generating something like $5 in free cash flow per share, right? So we're buying this legacy asset at five times earnings, uh, five times free cash flow, and then they're building this LEO business, and that LEO business is now fully funded. We've looked at the architectures of all of the LEO constellations. We think this is sort of the most interesting <coughs> one with the best architecture and will generate the highest 
you know, returns on invested capital. Again, they fully funded it. Uh, it's not going to fully launch because they're building it right now. It's not going to fully launch until 2024. So you don't start to see the benefits of the cash flows in that business till then. But um, I'll give you a little bit more detail. Hopefully I'm not overcomplicating the situation. But basically this was a private company and it was uh, two thirds owned by a public company. And so, and then what happened was the other uh, shareholder of the private satellite company, they owned one third of it and they wanted liquidity. So what they did was they merged the public entity with the private entity. And so this has no, it, it didn't go through the straight IPO path. It has no research coverage right now. I know Goldman and JP Morgan are sort of kicking the tires on it. So we think that's one catalyst to it. But the point is it's so undervalued because people just don't know it exists. And there was some weird index selling that happened in this name because um, of the way the merger happened and they dual listed in the US and Canada. So anyway, long story short, uh, cheap, um, really good technology, very good management team, um, totally underfollowed and fit sort of some of the secular themes that we believe in, um, you know, at ARS and, um, you know, kind of validated by John Malone, who I would argue is probably one of the smarter, you know, capital allocators in this industry. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of a, a, just a flavor for the types of stuff we look at and how we're essentially trying to do things a little differently than buying, except for the, you know, three companies I mentioned with the cloud exposure. We're sort of trying, we're trying to do things very differently than other people. Um, a couple of people on the call mentioned fintech. So again, maybe thrown out with the bathwater, you know, we are invested in a public company, if stock's down 70%, um, with, with, with sort of the drop in, in, in crypto and uh, where interest rates have gone. And this is a Canadian fintech company. We've got to, gotten to know the CFO and president, you know, really well to the extent that we're emailing um, a couple of times a week now and um, talking to him every month or so. And so this business, they uh, bought 40% uh, of the, um, basically the Coinbase of Canada. Um, and then they, they bought a piece of a crypto exchange in Canada. And then they also bought a broker dealer and they did all of this in 2020. And so what they did was they used that broker dealer to, to create a free stock trading app. So if you look at it, it looks exactly like Robinhood, but the difference is they're not selling um, you know, the volumes. They're basically making money on the app based on FX. So when people in Canada you know, trade US stocks, they make a little bit of a big on the FX. So that's how they're making money off this. Uh, what we like about it is one, it's down a lot. You know, It's a $250 million market cap. They have 100 million bucks in cash. So we're paying 150 million bucks for uh, an enterprise value for this business, and uh, they just launched the um, stock trading app. They're still in the process of backending the crypto and the NFT into the app, so all of their customers can kind of trade all three on the app. Um, and so we like the dynamic in Canada because. Um, they effectively have to regulate or get regulated in every province, especially. And so that's why you've seen a lot of U.S. foreign companies not move into Canada with fintech. Um, so we think the barriers are high. And the other thing we like is that, you know, as everybody knows, Canada is sort of a little bit different of an animal in terms of the banks being a little stodgier. And so they're not doing what the U.S. You know, retail brokers have done with free stock trading. They're still keeping the, you know, 8, 10, 12 bucks a trade. So the interesting thing here is that Again, we use a lot of data science in what we're doing. And so, you know, we're looking at the App Annie data in Canada, and we're seeing that this is, despite the fact that it's, again, a couple hundred million dollar company, they're, uh, they have the, the second highest app downloads of finance apps in Canada on App Annie after PayPal. So, um, you know, they're really growing. And so, you know, when you look at that data and you kind of back into numbers, the market has them growing their subscriber base by 75,000 a quarter. They've already done 100,000 downloads in January on, um, you know, the app. And so the point being, this is the kind of business that we want to own. I was on a call that one of our sell side brokers put on with Gemini, with the, the, the president of Gemini yesterday, and he was saying they raised money at $7 billion. You know, yeah, Canada's not the size of the U.S., but if these guys are doing the exact same thing, they have the credit card or the debit card that pays cash back in crypto. Um, so they're sort of doing the same thing. Yes, the market might be one-tenth of the size, but Gemini's raising money at $7 billion. I don't know why this company isn't worth a billion plus when it's trading at a couple hundred billion. So, you know, these are the kinds of opportunities we're looking for in the public markets. Um, in terms of my background, if that's helpful, um, as we were talking about earlier, I was at, uh, got into the investment business in 2006. I was at uh, Tiger Europe. 
um, you know, 2009 through 2012, and then I was at Cobalt and ran uh, the TMT consumer uh, you know, sector. It was about five, six hundred million dollars in exposure for for Wayne Cooperman there. Um, launched Papyrus in 2016. Um, folded it into ARS to work with uh, smart people like Stephen um, every day, which is nice. Uh, so that's kind of a nutshell of, of, of what we do, where we're seeing the, the, the value in the public markets. Again, back to Liberty, um, Greg Maffei was saying, you know, there's a lot of hype, right, in these markets, like I was talking about earlier, but if we can find those babies thrown out with the bathwater, like I think we have, where the satellite company is down 50%, the, um, you know, the, 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 the FinTech company is down 70% from the highs. So, you know, a whole portfolio of those we think will outperform, and, you know, we have an investor who came in late last year, and this is somebody, you know, I've grown up, grown up in the same town as me. Um, you know, he owns kind of a copper smelting, steel fabrication business, and he had told me that he was putting money in just because he doesn't want sort of exposure to the high growth stocks at ridiculous valuations and the FANG stocks. And so that's kind of the, the type of investor, and you know, old boss put in money um, uh, a few months ago on the same uh, thesis. So that's sort of the types of investors I think that this strategy appeals to where we can hopefully get the upside of um, you know the last few years of technology and kind of get that technology exposure but um, you know do it in a way where we think the risk reward is better and obviously we're doing it with a lot more diligence into the businesses we're buying than sort of you know buying the names of the index if that if that makes sense but that's uh, yeah I know that uh, ARS does these six transformations and yeah. which play into what you do, but <laughs> if you're just thinking some themes that you see, so sub themes of, you, of, of that you, know, you think we'll, we will see playing out across all asset classes in tech. In yeah, I mean, um, it's funny, I'm writing our quarterly letter on, on that exactly right now and kind of listing them all out, but I think one is obviously digital acceleration, right? You've seen that profession, you've seen that in the cloud, right? You've seen that like, yes, you know, Adele is talking about in, the, in um, you know, factories, you're seeing more automation, one, because it was accelerated in COVID just because, you know, they wanted to keep people out of factories. You're obviously seeing that with business processes, you're seeing that with the consumer, right? Even with streaming, the average consumer uses so much more data streaming than with linear television. So cord cutting really boosts that the, uh, the value the cable companies get um, from a broadband perspective. And so you, you know, we're, we own Charter, for example, at you know, 12 times free cash flow, buying back all their stock with free cash flow. Um, you know, $650 stock, we think they do $150 in free cash flow per share in four years. So, you know, you're trading your big business trading, you know, very stable, very predictable. Um, secular themes um, that, that, that we like, uh, trading at four times free cash flow a few years out. Um, you know, on top of that, uh, you know, we think that, you know, fintech is here to stay to some extent. You know, we're still getting our arms around to the extent to which crypto and NFT um, and sort of that trading is, you know, stimulus money versus what's long-term and what's sustainable. Obviously, we think, you know, the blockchain side is more sustainable. Um, and so, you know, that's another area, again, by this, uh, this Canadian fintech I was mentioning, um, you know, another area where we see value, same thing in overall data in terms of DRAM and memory. Uh, we think that, you know, businesses that are oligopolies like memory um, are, you know, somewhere where we want to, where we think companies are trading at 12, 14 times earnings uh, and growing with real price rationality. So those are kind of uh, a few of the themes that, that I think we're, we're, we're playing, uh, if that answers the question. Yeah. Any other questions? Nathan, can you just touch on, uh, there was some interesting comments out of the meeting about inflation and deflation pressures on pricing, and I think that's a fascinating area to just lay out since inflation is such a big topic. Yeah, so I think we, our view on some of that is, um, you know, uh, supply chains um, are out of whack right now. We think that abates base in the next nine months to a year, year and a half. Um, you know, we think the chip shortage abates base in the next six to eight months. And so, you know, our view is kind of similar to exactly what, what John Malone said. You know, we're at the 6% plus inflation level right now. If that drops to 3 or 4%, 
um, we think that's uh, that's a little bit more sustainable. That probably means two, two and a quarter percent tenure. Uh, the issue I think that, that we're looking at though is that we see energy inflation is a little bit more persistent. But aside from all of that, we think things are going to come back to normal to some extent. And we think multiples, again, um, probably of the high growth businesses, some of that gets sucked out into the market, um, especially as the Fed tapers. But, um, you know, we think that again, these, these businesses, like some of the bank businesses, some of these other businesses I, talk, I told you about that have lower multiples, we think there's real value in them. Um, so that's kind of our, 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 our view on all of that. So before we move from big picture, any questions on themes? That... You sort of, was that a little bit of a knock? You don't know if the NFTs are going to... We don't know. I mean, I'd be, I, I mean, we think it's going to be real, but the question is, is it going to be real at 30% of today's volumes or, you know, 150%? We just don't know, right? I mean, I think it's pretty amazing. It's sort of a provenance for, you know, kind of what's real, but the question is, you know, pay-to-play games, I think, is one area that I question whether or not there's um, excessive sort of inflation in some of these, some of these games. But, you know, I'm certainly not the expert uh, in that. Uh, we just try to go where the cash flows are, I think, because that's what we can justify. So do you think from the NFT space, look, I, art is obviously, it's hot right now, it's going to dry down. I don't see that continue. But in terms of every everything and anything in the world is experienced, right? So if you look at anything that you can sell and create an experience around it, doesn't matter if it's an event, to meet with Mark Shainer, pay 50 bucks, it can give you access to X, or you go to a fitness contest, you get to meet with Orrin. Are you willing to pay extra half a million dollars? Or Warren Buffett, if he's speaking, look, if you're able to pay $100,000 more, and Disney, the same thing, right? So if you look at how these channels work, the experience-led economy will sustain. Is that your point of view, or you think that's I mean, yeah, I just don't know how that, that kind of general ledger system, how is that different than what you can do today? Um, I just don't know how that's monetizable and how you sort of invest in it, how you make money off of it, I think. It's really that's, that's why we have venture. That's another thing. Like if you have companies like Live Nation, you have companies like Ticketmaster and StubHub. So these tickets are getting sold over and over, but the originator who's actually putting that experience, who's the co-owner, all of these resales are making money, 20, 30, 40, 50% margin, right? But the person who's actually creating that experience, he doesn't, but through the general ledger, ledger that money is passed on to the originator. If you're able to make, after, let's say, a ranger skip, take it 100 bucks, sold at 150. Who's making that endpoint? StubHub, Ticketmaster, or somebody like me who's transferring that ticket? But from that $50, Whereas that ticket was marked up. There's no tracking system. But through the general ledger, you'll be able to do this. 100% general ledger's blockchain but is if real. You, if you, are in it, if you think that statement is true, then then in terms of keeping that general ledger through the block channel, uh, uh, blockchain, that's a trillion dollar market. Right? Meaning if you I mean, look you, at overall You economy, can quantify it, right? The market is there. It's not that the market isn't there. It's, and your points are very valid, right? I understand that you're looking for cash flow and, and businesses that have, you know, a current business that you can actually understand from A to Z, right? The Canadian opportunity sounds totally, makes total sense to me, right? But in terms of when you say, I don't know how to quantify it, all of the businesses that are in place right now exist. We know what the size is and we know their growth, right? Collectible markets has been around for centuries. It's nothing new, right? If you want to buy a stock of values from 1648, you'll still buy a stock of values from 1648. And you'll pay 15 million euros for that if you want to. That's a going market rate for that, right? That's not going away. And there's going to continue. And, and since the world, there's the cash uh, availability is growing. It's not decreasing you're going to see more and more people putting money into these experiences. Now, when it comes to the gaming aspect or when it comes to ticketing, right, these are established businesses that currently have inefficiencies in them, right? And so what technology does in everything, right, AWS, right, that's what you can quantify. Right, you can quantify it. Right, you can, yeah, you can quantify it. And so an NFT is, you know, obviously a hot word that's used now a lot for collectibles, but... 
it's really about the immutability of data on the ledger. A public ledger that's immutable, and then that way you can get an experience where a creator could actually benefit from the subsequent sale. Hundred percent. We don't disagree with any yeah. of that, but we think you know that just gets integrated in the business, right? Is that any different than uh, a company using robotics in a data center, right, rather than labor? No, and so it gets integrated, right? Is it you know its own asset class, maybe? But in the public markets, how do you play that? I think is really the issue, and who are the winners? And how do you just, so is it just buying Microsoft, right? Are they sort of the, you know, 600 pound gorilla and something like that, right? Um, I think is the way we think about it. So you think the artificial intelligence is just a tool? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's all going to improve productivity. You're, you're saying NFT is here, and everyone is going at Yankees to any, all of these companies from Ticketmaster, if they don't innovate, basically they're done. Right. New players will rise up. It's just a tool. Agreed. I think our, our issue is more the, um, sort of putting value on some of this, you know, digital art, some of these sorts of things that we just don't want. We wonder if that's digital sardines, right? Which we can't put value on. It is hard to get your arms around that. I mean, from you know, from that perspective, I mean, I've been in the capital markets for way too long, 40 years now. I don't know what it is, but it's like okay, you get this amazing piece of art, okay? And I'm not a collector, so I'm just from a layman's perspective. And yet, I'm seeing news uh, segments of just the having it digitally in this like, metaverse scenario. And bear with me because my terminology, I'm sure, is awful here. But that not having a direct uh, tangibility to it, and the price is being paid, is, is to me, it's just mind-boggling. And it's like, how is that sustainable? I mean, to to the point of the discussion. So it's interesting because the NFTs comes down to the ledger, which I didn't have can boil down to, at least that's what I'm, I'm taking here. So that I think, I agree, that's going to be just something that evolves and will be sustainable. But the, the metaverse and the experience, uh, I agree, it's kind of like hard to, hard to get around, arms around it from a consumer-based scenario. If I, I would separate the two out, right? Okay. I think that you're making great points here, and I really love your perspective on it because you have the experience in investing in the right areas, right? The, the art space of NFTs, I think that you need to kind of block it off and separate it because there is a tremendous amount of uh, momentum in that market, mm -hmm. and it's fueled by simply a very cash-rich uh, uh, target audience mm -hmm. that, that just are doing it because they know they can trade really well. Okay. Right? They come in, typically there are about 80,000 uh, what we call whales that have 1,000 Bitcoin or more, and those people are really good at identifying, you know, something at like 0 0.1 ETH and then simply like, you know, reselling it and creating momentum for themselves, right? Sure. So that's where the momentum is coming from. And, and, and because, you know, if you look at the total number of crypto wallets in the world, there's about 400 million, but nobody actually knows. There's not a single human being, including myself, that can actually tell you how many human beings is behind, are behind those crypto wallets. It could be 100 million. It could be 50 million, it could be 100,000. Nobody really knows. I've heard that. The estimate is that it's probably less than 100 million. It's right. certainly less than 400 million because people have multiple wallets, right? And so we know that as more people come into it, there's going to be new money coming into the space. So there is a, there is a belief that while it's incredibly hot right now, there is no, there, it's, it's not stopping the, the feeder pipe of new people coming on and trying it out is so big and the momentum is so big that even if any of those big holders, the whales, pull back, the market has enough momentum to sustain itself and grow. It. And there's new creators coming online. Mm -hmm. I would separate out that because it is a speculative market, right? And, and I think that the businesses who are in that space have a, an absolute viability because even though you and I, we still like to read the Sunday paper, I'm 47 years old, I like to read my New York Times physically, you just have to look at the newspaper from yesterday to see that, again, a whole bunch of you know, titles have been shut down, not because we don't like to read them, but because, unfortunately, the younger people don't even think about reading it physically. Yeah. So the metaverse experience, which I'm separating out from everything else, while crazy to us, it really is crazy. Even to me, it's crazy. Okay. For my son, my eight-year-old... Yeah. This is his life. He lives there. He doesn't live where we live. He lives there. <laughs> and so the whole metaverse experience, as much as unrealistic for us because we just are not living in that space,
for them is a very real thing, and they have continued to develop. And imagine the following. You and I are incredibly comfortable in going to Amazon.com on the app and buying stuff. I mean, I'm sure that you and I have been members of Amazon for at least 20 years. They know everything about me, everything, right? Imagine a different way of shopping Amazon. Imagine actually being in the store in the metaverse and buying stuff from Amazon, right? That is what the metaverse is. It's taking the 2D experience that you and I are so familiar with and taking it into a, a real life experience for them. So where the problem with metaverses are, and this is going to be the real war, is between, you know, Meta, which is Facebook, right? Microsoft, Amazon, any of those are creating their own metaverses. They're going to be... In, you know, they're not going to be interoperable. And so the question is, you know, are you going to be part of the Samsung metaverse world and the Apple metaverse world? And the Nobody knows. And that's, that's going to be a challenge. But like anything else, there's always space for multiple platforms. Clearly, we see it now, right, with multiple platforms, you know, owning the market. There is space for that. The final part I would say, and then I'll politely shut up, is that the NFT business side of it in terms of exactly what these two gentlemen are saying, there is a lot of inefficiencies in markets. The technology of blockchain, which he's not disputing, nobody's, I think, disputing that, and the technology of a immutable data set that you could change, but I know you changed it, right? So anybody can change it. That's not the issue. It's about knowing who did and when they did and what they did. That creates a whole new set of capabilities for Companies who are currently struggling in certain areas, either in product safety, maintenance, recycling, you name it. So you can go through an entire product life cycle and see all the problems along the way. And I think that that's where there's a lot of opportunity. So I would separate all these three out. That makes sense. And then you can maybe get a better sense of that. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I usually don't like people dominating the conversation, Sorry. but I like it when you dominate the conversation. <laughs> I'm please, please, please. We got to meet. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, bringing all that up, too. Any, any, anyone from the anyone from the Zoom have think anything but comments or questions? Die down. There's only so many transactions you can do. Anyone at home? I'm home. Not trading crypto apps anymore. Home is not the right word. Anyone anyone on the, the Zoom have questions I or comments? For one Mark, I think there's some questions in the chat. Someone okay. wrote. Okay, you're in charge of the chat. Asher, you're in charge now of the chat because I can't. Oh, okay. Well, why someone asked. Why don't you moderate? Hey. Jacob asked, any concerns of the ethics and or social impacts of the upcoming generation living in the metaverse? Good question. Living is the question. This is, this is right back to Doron, and, and I'm trying not to let him dominate. <laughs> What's so, the question? It's, maybe we can, we can reply offline. Uh, mm -hmm. Any uh, concerns about the uh, ethics? Ethics was... and or social impacts of the upcoming generation living within the metaverse? It's a great question, and I am certainly not an anthropologist, and I would never claim to be one, but I do know some very well-known one, like N. Kira, who used to be the head anthropologist for Microsoft, and has worked with Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates for many years, and she worked with me on projects, and Uday Dandavate. If you ever want, you can offline me, and I can connect you with these people. I think that the social impact of you know, people living in a, in a different dimension is, for us, difficult to comprehend because, again, we, we come just from a different foundational background. Um, I think that the new generation doesn't necessarily disconnect from the real world. They just integrate it, and they have multiple experiences simultaneously, and they feel very comfortable, it seems, from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, they seem very comfortable in coming in and out of those experiences and being able to then have a conversation with me while still being inside. So I think that, again, for you and me, you know, I think that I, I don't know you personally, but I, I like to read a book, right? I enjoy that experience. That, to me, is my metaverse because I am going into the, the writer and I'm experiencing what the writer is trying to tell me. I think that they're just, it's just a different way of that experiencing, you know, uh, uh, feeling that experience. It's not better or worse, it's just different. Let, let me segue onto that, Asher, if I could, over to Don Burton, because he's been investing in education, because I think there's that, definitely that dimension here, and I feel like Phil Donahue with a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's pretty funny. Walk, walk over <laughs> with my microphone. I mean, my Mac. Yeah. Oh, great teams. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks. Uh, so, so, so introduce yourself again and, and how you see this world. Sure. So again, my name is Don Burden. I'm the managing partner of uh, education and learning and human capital, uh, venture capital fund that focuses on one sector. And I can give you examples of how people, you know, kind of move between the metaverse and the real world in our education application. So, you know, again, I don't think it's going to be like, oh, I only live in the metaverse, I, I don't live in the real world, or I live in the real world, and I don't live in the metaverse. You're seeing much more movement between these in a much more, you know, again, we're at the very beginnings of the metaverse, and, you know, we're going to be moving into a completely immersive environment. We're going to have mixed reality sitting here on the table while we're all sitting here. We're going to have, you know, media objects that just come up and look like they're 3D and look like they're in the real world. Um, and a couple examples of just, you know, education, you know, there's a, there's a kind of an easy example of, you know, you can do simulations now. So, again, again simulations in the metaverse are much more, much more present, much more realistic. You get your whole body into it, and that's really important from a cognitive science point of view to have emotion, to have presence, to have, like, it's really real, right? And, um, you know, the simulations originally happened with, things like flight simulators. Evan Sutherland was you know, one of the first flight simulators. And um, you know, the, the, the machines were millions of dollars because the cost of a mistake are huge. You, love, you lose lives and you lose billions of dollars worth of equipment. So people are willing to pay millions of dollars for flight simulations, right? But now you're getting the horizontal platforms, you know, very inexpensive, creating that type of an experience, which is just unbelievably powerful. Um, You've got an example of like a race car driving simulation, digital metaverse simulation, where the person drives and trains in the metaverse and then goes out and beats NASCAR and Formula One racers without ever having raced before in the real world. So like this is, you know, it's kind of a simulation of the real world and they can go out to the real world and be a competent performer in the real world. And, and I believe that from an education and learning point of view, that's the power of the metaverse is, you know, again, I can get competent in a flight simulator and then I can go out in the real world and be highly competent. Yeah. And again, you know, one of our uh, theses in the education space, and we can talk more about that later, is, you know, we have this really crazy system we call the schooling model. <laughs> the schooling model is the silliest thing in the world. Kids go in, they listen to lectures, they take notes, they, they give multiple choice tests back, and you get an A. What's an A mean? It doesn't mean anything. Like, I can't go do anything. And, like, even at MIT and Harvard, they can't tell you how the moon rotates around the Earth. Like, they can't apply any of their knowledge. They just get good A's. So you have this, these excellent sheep, is a term that uh, one author called it, that just play the game of schooling really well, and they get a bunch of opportunities. And we all probably played that game well because we had great opportunities because it's a winnowing system. But in this new metaverse, you're going to actually be able to go get real competences in the real world that matter. That, that add value to the real world. And so you're going to see a major transformation from this industrial age, silly schooling model we have to a much more real world confidence building model. And that's going to be the innovation age model. And we're at a very historic point where we're going to have a major transformation. Like we went from you know, the agricultural age and you had an apprenticeship model where you'd go be a blacksmith, but you couldn't read, or write, or do arithmetic, but got really good at being a blacksmith because you were under apprenticeship. Well, now we can, you know, change our system to combine the attributes of all the best throughout history and the new affordances of technology and create an entirely new system of education. And that's coming down the pike. And, um, and I, I'm excited. It's not like one or the other and there's not ethics and, and things. It's like, you know, people would say that about, you know, the printing press. Like, oh, my gosh, we're not going to talk anymore. And we're not going to have the oral Iliad tradition. You know, we're going to have books. This is terrible. Well, no, we just adapt and adjust and we, we take hopefully the benefits and anything can be used negatively or positively. And hopefully as a human species, we just figure out the best positive uses of the, all this stuff. Um, and I can give another example of edgy learning, which is a, a, a kind of a Web3 thing where they are using tokens and DAOs to make it much more engaging for students to kind of dive into topics that they care about. And it's a really great use of you know, NFT and token and crypto type of technology in the education space where it just, it takes a great experience that already exists, like an experience that already exists, but now it pumps it up with 
you know, more like I'm an owner of this experience, and when I contribute, I get paid back more. So I want to be in this environment instead of another environment like Facebook, where I don't get rewarded for all my participation. So, so basically, it's just a, you know, it's one innovation, and it's a layered tech stack, um, and people are still going to create better experiences, and the people that create better experiences win in certainly the education and learning space. So that's my quick. So oh, good. I should like record you. <laughs> Thank you. That's very sure. There you go. So you want to detail Donahue again? Well, no, no. Just, well, <laughs> since you've got the, the microphone, so, um, we all wanted to figure out how to, how to invest now in these themes um, as it relates to blockchain and related, you know, as sometimes with cannabis, I like, I like fund to funds. Uh, I like specialty funds. And you represent one of those. I think you're an interesting way to uh, to, to to play uh, education across the, the space. Yeah. Um, what what theme? Just, you know, give us one theme that you think is going to uh, be most transformative in, in education. Yeah, I just I think that if we take you know taking a step back and looking at all the asset classes that you can invest in, you know. You know, we talk about public markets and private markets, and we had a good description overview of the public markets uh, by ARS. And in the private markets, you know, I think you know for the last several years, venture capital has been by far the best performer in in the private markets, and continues to be such the best performer of all asset classes. And what you see is Kauffman Foundation has done a study that, on average, Specialty domain expert VCs do much more than horizontal kind of, I'm going to invest in everything, all the opportunity type of VCs, right? So domain experts get better returns on average than horizontal investors. And again, our space, our sector in DC of education, learning, human capital, or human flourishing, because you're going to have a totally reconfiguration of this sector because it's not like you go to school and you're done and then you're just going to work the rest of your life. You have to continuously learn forever. You got a new skill, you got an upskill, you got a reskill. That happens throughout your entire life. So you're going to this sector is is just going to go through this amazing transformation in a in a huge fundamental way. So it's not like one theme like oh web3 is going to affect the education sector. It's like we need to rethink what experiences we give everybody, not just from birth, but through adulthood. We give them really crummy experiences in this thing we all think of when we conceive of education. We think, oh, schooling. Well, no, that's a crummy intervention to get someone up a confidence curve. So, you know, this sector is going to be totally historically transformed. And, you know, we are the best betters in this space. Like, we have an amazing track record. And so, again, VC best asset class specialized people, best performers in that asset class. This sector, unbelievable upside, and I have slide decks that show the kind of TAM of a transformation of the education sector. Amazing sector that's going to go through unbelievable transformation, social impact, wealth creation, and oh, by the way, we've been in it longer than anyone else, and we're the leaders in the space with the best performance in the space. So again, you know, we have, and, and oh, we're a seed fund, which is the best alpha. We talked about the, the barbell. You know, get up at the beginning when there's a lot of judgment because, you know, I've been a serial entrepreneur in the education space. I was a cognitive sciences undergrad. I've been investing for decades plus now. We know this space unbelievably well. Actually, yeah, I have a follow-up to that question. Actually, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, thanks. So, hi, Aaron Michelson. I'm with um, Summary AI. Um, so, we work in the higher education education space. So we're very interested, obviously, because we quantify social impact and culture. And um, as we're looking, do you know specifically what um, what companies are working um, in this space and what colleges are using um, Web3 assets right now for community building and for student engagement, specifically around student engagement? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the metrics that everyone would be measuring right now, I think, are trivial metrics. I mean, like, you know, you go to a college and what do you learn? You know, there's a lot of data now that, you know, the college, um, the college analytics, CLA, whatever that stands for, college learning assessment. You know, you go to college and you get better at communication, critical thinking, creative thinking, whatever. No, <laughs> it doesn't move. Like you went to Harvard because you're, you know, you're pretty good, and you graduate from Harvard because you're pretty good. So whatever metrics you're looking at, what what I'm talking about is like reinventing college, not just like digitizing what we do today and looking at the output of what we do today. Because I think that's 
that's going away, the way of the dodo. And so, so basically, what, what a, an example I'll give you is Andela. Are you familiar with Andela in Africa? Okay, so Andela reinvented what a higher education institution is. So it basically takes the top 1% of all kids in Africa that have very limited opportunity, and it dramatically changes their lives. If they don't have to pay for college, they get selected um, you know, through whatever assessment of vehicles they do. They go to college free, it's a tech college. They basically train for a, a minimum amount of time as possible, and then they get placed at Facebook, Google, IBM, Microsoft, and they do real projects as part of their training and part of their college experience. Facebook, Google, and all those guys are paying for college. They're not running up $80,000 worth of debt per year. They're free and clear because the best way to learn is by actually going and doing something and getting feedback from a community of experts that know what the heck they're doing, not you know some arbitrary dude in an ivory tower who's never done this stuff. <laughs> so, so bottom line is it's a much better effective higher education institution, Andela in Africa. I'll look it up. So this, this is the type of reinvention that's going on, and so it's really not, you know, when people look at, you know, the output of what the system produces today is uh, a bad ad, uh, output. It's like, you know, dinosaur hunting, hunters. Like, we don't want to produce any more di dino dinosaur hunters because dinosaur hunters don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, the industrial age skill set of being able to rewrite arithmetic, certainly it's, it's um, you know, necessary but not sufficient at all for the innovation age. So we need to reinvent how we conceive of education, and what are the outputs of education, what's the process of education, all that is up for grabs now. And again, the pandemic has accelerated all these trends and intensified the debate about what kind of experiences are we actually giving students, learners, and oh my gosh, what a horrid thing we're doing as a civilization across the globe. So, so I'm, an abolition, I'm an abolitionist when it comes to the existing schooling systems. It will certainly take a bunch of time to transition from what we have today to this new world, but it's all happening right now. And I'm an abolitionist. I don't want to reform what we have today. I want to reinvent what we have today. Yeah. So, that, that, so that's the difference. You know, whatever metrics you're looking at, they're crummy metrics. <laughs> uh, any other uh, questions from the chat, Asher, since you're in charge? <laughs> Poor Asher. <laughs> I guess well, I wonder, can, do you think a lot of that can be accomplished sort of online, or do you think you have to kind of go into some of these regions where, you know, you're shutting down coal mines and so forth we are, to think, actually evangelize people? I think you'll see uh, uh, quite an assortment of types of implementations mm -hmm. of the new model of education. Um, Certainly now the stats are pretty much in, the research is in, you can get effective results online completely 100% online. So it, it, it's just as good. I mean, think about your in-class experience sitting in a lecture getting things. It's like, you know, I can do a lot better job 100% online than what they're doing in physical classrooms today. Um, but hybrid models are really good, meaning if you're in a community of practice, um, I've got a blog series on Medium um, that I write things in. And one of my first kind of real learning experience, I call it a real school, was at McKinsey and Company as a business analyst. So, you know, you, you know, if you want to learn business problem solving, the best way to do it is just go do it with a lot of people that are really smart at doing it, and they scaffold the hell out of you because you try something, you fail, they give you feedback. And you kind of need that. Now, you can get a lot of that online, but I would say being in the same room with, you know, ex-consultants that were really scaffolding me, that's a very helpful thing. So hybrid will always be there, but you'll, you'll be, always be supported in physical, in-person RIL stuff with digital and online stuff. Makes sense. Yeah. So what about, one last question for you. So when you think about kind of very, very low level, like baseline level programming, I feel like you know, any, at least in the last four or five, four or five years ago, any friends sort of in the startup space has always complained that they couldn't get enough, you know, HTML5 engineers or something like right. that. Do you think that the baseline kind of, I hate to say, like intellectual level is kind of, that threshold is too high? Or do you think for something like sort of that low level programming, could you go to, you know, older people, and again, these coal mining towns just use that as an example and actually train them to do that? Or do you think it's just, it's not? 
Yeah. Possible. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a lot of examples of people doing that right okay. now. So, so in other words, there's kind of fully online stuff, like Lambda School mm -hmm. is a coding yeah. school that is completely online mm -hmm. and can train those people at the shutdown coal mine. Mm -hmm. And they literally can take people from, you know, it doesn't matter what your background. Now, yes, you know, you, you know, there's good students and not so good students that can get up that learning curve more quickly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at any sample, any population sample at, in the coal mine town, you're going to get great and you're going to get, you know, whatever that normal distribution curve is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically, uh, you know, there's general assembly that does those entry level stuff. Yeah. There's plural site that does the upskilling once you get in a corporation and you're, you know, you're a coder. And you know you keep getting better on what the new stack is and Web3 and Metaverse and you know all the new technologies you've got to keep up to speed with and learn how to learn mm -hmm. and get all the new the new you know programming languages or the new whatever and so Pluralsight is an example of a company that does that once you're in the um, once you're in the corporation space so again there's kind of new skilling upskilling reskilling <coughs> that it's you know really hot now and there's a ton a ton of stuff happening okay across all of those areas. Thank you. Harjeet, you have 500 portfolio companies. Are any of them in this educational space? So there, there are several. Um, but to, to add to your point, what exactly is going at, for talk about Ruby on Rails, always been there. You can't find any developers who knows how to, do, how to do, develop that code or work on that uh, product. Mm -hmm. So guess what? These American companies hiring somebody in Africa, somebody in India, Ukraine, and paying almost twice as much money. You always thought India was a back office, your labor arbitrage, you pay somebody 80 bucks here, 26 bucks in India, the way we like looked at it, mm -hmm. we lost 200 engineers last year. I'm just, right, because we were in the startup ecosystem where we said, okay, our direct cost in terms of what we charge, uh, $6 an hour, and our what we charge our portfolio company, $35 in terms of Per hour cost, right? We're in the business of so unit economics, and each hour is money for us. We had to go out and retrain 100 freshers, somebody who has no interest in life in terms of getting a job, hiring us in their senior year, training them, and bringing them into the ecosystem. To your point, which is so there's a lot of in the, in the ed tech, in the tech space, right? There's a lot of resource crunch right now. To me, Lambda School solves that problem because you're able to, what we call it, fresher when you don't have to get a four-year education. You will get a year worth of code and you, you don't pay for tuition. Wherever you go for a job, they take X percentage of your salary for a couple of years, and guess what? Then you're on your own. Why do you need philosophy, psychology? That's good you know, in terms of training people's minds. It's great, but if you're somebody who grew up with nothing, you know, for you, what matters is what's in the bank or what's coming for you every week. So that solves the inequality issue. In India, look, there's 1.4 billion people, but if you look at it, it's in the last uh, 10 years, uh, the job market in terms of there's so much talent out there, so the only way you actually get real people in order to train is if you hire and you retrain them, because the people who are talented, there has been 90 unicorns out of India. By 2025, we're looking at about 250 unicorns out of India. So a lot of talented people are going to go towards to work for startups. There were about, I think, close to a thousand uh, millionaires out of the, uh, the, uh, the company that Walmart bought in India in order to com compete with Amazon. So you have, uh, you know, I can just relate to these things because we experience it. We had to make it. We are making an acquisition to acquire a company in the third city where these kids are engineers are not ambitious to come to tier two or tier one city. They want to stay here. You pay them extra money. Right, and you solve that resource crunch. So, in order to build up and solve the inequality issues, you're going to have to bring in new people from who are in finance, marketing, and say, "Well, you probably make more money. We'll train you for those resources through Lambda, other resources." That's the way to go in terms of HTML, those coding, Ruby on Rails, SAP, and others. You know, if you really talk to them in their S1 and all, this is gross. This all of them. In India, companies are giving iPhones. Motorcycles as a gift if you're able to come and join them as a freshman. That's a thousand dollar bonus for that economy. That's that is a lot of money. Crazy. Have you seen Times of India? I look, I'm not saying, but in terms of that is the biggest back office. How many people? I'm just trying to remember. I, I would see like six or seven on a motorcycle. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's, that's, yeah, two or three at a time. <laughs> I, I got I got some videos to prove it. Any other per perspective? No, you do. Those I, I, are, I, I, yeah, I, Mary, go. I love you to chat to jump in on this. Ron, fascinating. Love listening to you guys, all, all of you. But then I, I want to take a little bit further. So, so like I lived in India the last couple of years, right? and and was working in Chennai, and I went there to build my company there because I've worked in India over 15 years now, going back and forth, uh, and working for some of the largest conglomerates, Microsoft, Shell, a lot of companies. And so, incredible talent, incredible people, incredible heart, incredible food, right? So, all the, all the important stuff first. But uh, at the end of the day, I love the model they're pulling up in India. So, if you look at someone like a Dr. Shetty, I don't know if anybody's familiar with him, yeah? Shetty is, first of all, one of the top heart surgeons in the world. He did the first heart transplant in a child in India. He was Mother Teresa's. Uh, heart surgeon, but at the end of the day, you know, he he put an incredible learning model together. You know, these kids don't have to go to school for four or eight years to learn how to become good doctors, right? And so, what he's doing in India, because number one, they can't afford it, right? And this model he's picking up, he's bringing it now into the into the Caribbean, and and, and uh, what he's doing is he's taking kids in rural areas because. Anyone who knows anything about India, majority of the people, even though 1.4 billion, still live in very rural communities, right? And by the way, Leo, right, is going to help transform, what you were yeah. talking about earlier, the ability to help learn online, right? So finally, we're getting to places where we couldn't reach technology-wise simply because we didn't have bandwidth there, right? And so now that's going to create even more, uh, and, and Starlink, you know, all the big guys, they're going to they're change the world and help us continue to do that. But what they're doing, and Amref is another big company in Africa, right, that's doing this, is they're, they're creating the opportunity to pull these kids in, young, young kids, because doctors know to get in front of disease, you've got to catch it early. So they're building centers where they're just starting to, to, to take kids in and teach them who are interested in learning that part of, of that in that industry just to do simple triage work, right, giving them the basic tools to get in front of, you know, diabetes is a huge uh, disease, right, for example, in India, right? To get in front of some of these some of these diseases that are out there that are truly taking over people's um, uh, lives, right? And so, so they're putting boots on the ground, and they're building little educational centers, right, where they're going in, and they're not building it from scratch. They're just taking over buildings uh, uh, and going in into small little buildings, you, what, what we would consider a shack <laughs> to walk in, but they're going in and they're teaching kids, right, and they're teaching them, and they're also in, in places where they can, teaching them online. And so they, so they do just that. They teach them online for a period of time, and then they bring them in to like Shetty's um, place, in, whether it's in Bangalore or whether it's in one of the larger cities, right, and, and they bring them into those hospitals, and they give them that opportunity to kind of get that hands on, right? Because I've said since the 2007, I think, when I went to Avnet, I remember we were com one of the ladies were complaining at, at one of our executive meetings that we don't kids coming out of college don't have enough common sense they don't know how to you know when we grew up we knew how to just make it happen right we had to wear five five ten fifteen different hats right and we just didn't have a problem with that kids even then you know had a problem with that and, and they didn't want to do too many things well that's because we didn't give them a chance you know we always kind of had some had millennials so so I'm pretty fond of that younger generation to be honest much more fonder than my generation and so um, and so but we've got to give them a chance too. So the key to being able to pull those people in and put them in a scenario where you give them a bit of education and then you bring them in and you give them some hands-on capability, it really gives them an opportunity to figure out, is this for me, right? Is this really for me? Because how many kids go through get an education? I know people with six degrees, many degrees of the thermometer and they're not doing anything. They got a degree in physics, they're a PhD and they're doing IT program, uh, program management, right? So give them an opportunity to figure out what they want you know, to do and then from there, yeah, they can they can expand. They can figure out what is that long term. I think one of the biggest problems we have today as well is we don't give them a roadmap, right? And we don't talk to them about what's important to them. You know, so I think we always got to approach people and meet them where they are and figure out well what are you dreaming about, right? Yeah. And I think we need to in include that in teaching, by the way, in yeah. education because we don't do enough of that. Right. We don't do enough of the soft side, right. right? We teach these kids and we teach them how to code or or how to you know, work in the financial world or, or, or how to go be great on Wall Street, but we don't teach them how to be human beings and we don't teach them how to think with a mindset of what's important for my next step. I always tell people who yeah. I, and a lot of people around the world Mary, work for me. Wrap, yeah. wrap up that thought, I'm gonna, yeah. I want to keep going. A lot of people that work for me around the world and, and one of the things I said was, you know, 
when they, when they talk about looking for that next job, I say, actually, what's the job after the next job? Because that determines what your next step is, really, right? So you can to think further about what is it that they're really trying to achieve, right? And I think we need to teach kids how to think that way, the younger generation as well, right? So I'll just pause with that. Just Thank to you. add one point, so there's an Indian company called Baiju, which is backed by Google, Facebook, and all of that. It's the largest so if you, ha if you haven't it's looked at it, if you have young kids or your grandkids, look, my daughter has been learning coding for about $10 an hour and she does it on a Saturday, about eight classes, and just look at their package. They acquired a company called White Hand Junior. The only thing was how to learn, they start from game development, right? Mm -hmm. How to move a robot, just like what we were doing on Apple when we were in fourth and fifth grade. Now they're starting teaching music. Just think about that. You have an instrument, somebody on the other side, okay, play these notes, this is what you do, you follow instruction. From some, we were a blackboard economy, now we're becoming a digital economy is where we're instruction-led uh, economy. So things are changing faster than you and I can. It wouldn't be a meeting, hold that thought. But um, I guess in the chat, somebody, Rob Colarina, if anybody knows him. Did he ask a question? Yeah, he, 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 we, would like to, we would like to ask a question. Rob, if you Hey, Mark, thank you. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Okay, great. Just, just, a, just a quick question on, on this education theme. Um, it just seems that um, so the movement towards the virtual and, and the like, um, I think the speaker two ago, um, I'd be curious as to, are you seeing um, less or more commitment towards education? Because one of the things, you know, for universities was, was seeking tenure and these other, you know, and these, you know, these other stability areas. And it just seems like there may be disincentive of staying long-term and, and granting tenure by the universities or people seeking that. But um, I, I wanted to hear from um, the expert. I guess this question to you, Don. Yeah, and so the question was, is tenure and that, that kind of, those type of systemic things a problem for moving in this direction? Is that the question? Is that the question, Rob? Yeah, that, that, that would address it pretty, uh, pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as you're saying, so I'm an evolutionist, evolutionist again, so I believe that the, the higher education institutions we have today need to be radically transformed. And if you, if you read Scott Galloway, he, he's got a lot of thing about how, you know, like most of these universities that exist today, we got 4,000 plus in the U.S. alone. Half of those just don't serve any function at all. And so basically you're going to have a huge falling away as they go bankrupt and they couldn't get through COVID and you're going to see a lot more, um, you know, going away of, of our 4,000 institutions of higher education. It's happening. It's happening. And again, yeah, the tenure track and stuff, they just want to do the research. They don't want to to have anybody learn. Like, you know, if you look at a college situation, it's kind of crazy, you know? It's like professors don't really care about their students. They care about getting research and getting the next grant and getting tenured. And it's a totally different game than helping people learn. But that's where all the money comes from, for the institution. So it's this crazy market forces that exist today in this crazy system we have. Large, um, large universities versus small little yeah, large universities. Harvard, like Harvard, Harvard, and those, all those research universities, yeah. it's the same pattern, but they're going to exist because they serve a real function, right? I mean, they're, they're like advancing knowledge across the board. And so, yes, the top 100 institutions are, are safe. <laughs> and secure, um, and they're going to keep going. Um, but you're going to see just very different models. And um, as the point was made here, you know, we have this game where we kind of like go play the schooling game for 23 years of your life. But what what skill sets do you actually develop when you play that game for 23 years of your life? And, and Google's done all the research. Like your grades and SAT scores and everything has no predictive value of how you're going to perform at Google. And Google people ops have done all the research now. It's just a silly game to get good at schooling, and yes, it winnows everyone out and gives certain people opportunities, but it has no predictive value. And, and what we've got here is a game where you're trying to get 100% of the people into the top 10% so they can get good opportunities. But that's crazy. Like reform is like, oh, we're going to go to at-risk populations and help them play this game better. They're never going to play this game as well as somebody else. But in the real world, there's an infinite amount of roles and responsibilities, and let's find out who I am and what I can be in the top percent of something. Let's go match what that is and get you up that confidence building curve. So to the point of you know being able to look at music, looking at coding, looking at robotics, you know let's get 
kids out in the real world instead of in this crazy artificial game called schooling and then see what they're interested in and see what they're competent and the more passionate you are about something, mm -hmm. the more confident you're going to get. Passion is a more important predictor of how you're going to get confident and whether you're going to be in the top 10 percent or not than, than other factors. Grit and passion um, is, is, is a so really important So do you agree reading and writing are the two most skills out of anything in terms of wherever you go in life? Yeah, so reading and writing absolutely critical and you can teach them in 100 hours exactly. once I'm ready. Exactly. So that's the whole point. Like you look, talk to teachers like John Gatto wrote a whole boat, book, book on this. Why are we holding them for 23 years of their lives when I can teach a kid how to read, write, and do arithmetic in 100 hours? So what, we, 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 came, what, we came in to talk about invest, we came in to talk about investing. <laughs> But we went down a specialty rabbit hole. But go ahead. But this is important. On uh, before, before I share my reflection, um, did anyone saw the Super Bowl uh, Jeff Bezos advertisement for Alexa? Not yet. Uh, he shared it on Twitter. I highly, highly recommend that we watch it because that ad addresses skills and attitudes. Alexa thinks for you, for you, is it good or bad? And I'm getting to this question about um, the new model for education. So what I keep hearing is improvement of, of skills, efficiency, right time. But education is so much more than that. Education is about um, humanity. When there is a time in those um, new models for educational system to develop yeah, yeah. the perspective on life, the perspective on AI, the limits of AI, Stephen Hawking warned us about that. So if we will not build, you know, that that humanistic perspective into into those models that are based on efficiency and on skills improvement. Well, why do you assume that, oh, that, that, that this new model can't be used for humanity? Uh, why do you make that assumption? Uh, no, I'm not making... Uh, right. I, I'm hearing a lot about skills and efficiency. Yeah. So in, any, any domain of life. So if you want to be a philosopher, the first philosophy academies of Plato and Pythagoras, they were groups of people that wanted to understand how to big, build, live a better life. What's a life worth living? It wasn't some theoretical thing where I listened to a lecture and I got an A on a multiple choice test. It was like, how do I live better? And we're going through this now with mindfulness. There's a mindfulness revolution. You know, I want to be more centered. I want to be aware. I don't want to be captured and reactive all the time. So this is living a better life. That's philosophy. And you can, there's lots of great online skill building things to help you be a better mindfulness person and to not just be the superficial headspace get 10 minutes of relief a day, it's like, how do I have better awareness? I've got different levels of self. The autobiographical self is just one small piece of that. I've got an experiencing self, I've got a core self, and I can tap into awareness around all those things in a mindful way. That, that is happening online right now. It's a real skill set that makes you more confident in the real world, and it's a humanity here. So, so it's not just... It's in my traditional mind, yeah. Yeah. the skill set about self-awareness <laughs> is sort of oxymoron because there is much more than skills that can be tested. But anyhow, I'd be delighted to take that conversation yeah. of yeah. mine. Well, well, we were going to have, by the way, we were but having... I have another question about public markets and Leo. All right, we're back to investing. Good. Pause, pause, pause. For anybody here, I need you to circle what you're going to eat, what you'd like to eat. And put your name in order. order. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, can I see that when you're done? Sure. I think what she's saying is about investing. No, no, no. Yeah, no. I don't know if, if you'll be able to. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the back of my glass. <laughs> yeah, and then give it to Steven. It's really about the output to the outcome. And it's about learning them. So my question. All right, let her One other question. Do you want to say anything? You can okay. Here we go. You can support uh, the question about um, the metaverse. We know that metaverse is far more than uh, um, the artificial intelligence that uh, digital twins that help in the industry and so on. Um, Public markets, looking at the stock value of Meta, blockchain, uh, they are not buying that story. So can you...
share with you, you know, again, your thinking around that, when the public markets will have enough confidence in terms of, you know, buying again the metal stack, the blockchain, or the block uh, stack. And um, the, the, the second question is, um, what is the name of the satellite your company that you guys are investing in? So this happens all the time. <laughs> Cherry picking. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm new to the game, so I don't know if I can ask this question. It's also or not. how you how you exit. So it's important to talk to him about that too. Go ahead. Um, so I would say <laughs> on Meta, I think some of the reason the stock was down so much, or Facebook, the stock was down so much, is one, it was sort of a, a triple whammy of events. One, you had sort of user growth flatlining for kind of legacy Facebook. Two, you have this issue with Apple changing um, what's called their IDFA, which is, you know, uh, the ability for um, an app to target an individual. So, you know, you're on your iPhone and, you know, for, for them to know your sort of age, your location, all of that stuff, Apple's kind of shifted that a little bit. And that's why Snapchat has had these, you know, crazy moves on the same thing. And and not to, not to digress, but part of the reason Apple's doing that is because that helps them kind of shift more money onto their own advertising platform. So people go to them and spend money with them rather with them than with the apps themselves. So we'll see if there's any antitrust issues with that. But uh, aside from that, so, so those were the two, and then the third was the $10 billion that he mentioned spending on Meta. Um, and I would say I don't have a good answer to the question in that um, I think it really depends on when that revenue starts to come to fruition. I think Oculus revenues are still so low. You have to get the tech better. Um, you have to make you know the, the goggles more ubiquitous so that, you know, Stephen and I were talking about this. Uh, a month or two ago, right, about, you know, are our phones going to shift to, and you brought it up, right, are our phones going to shift to um, all of us just using these goggles instead of going on Zoom at some point? And I think the battery life, all of those things need to get better, um, but it, you know, probably ends up happen, happening, and to the point you mentioned about the holograms, too, you know, uh, all of that's kind of the meta. Um, I think it's just too early to tell who the winner is, but I think but part of the, the process that we have is we really like only investing in the right management teams <clears throat> because we think that they see the next thing and they sort of, you know, reinvent the business. Um, and they think something like we're in GISH to give you one of the names we're invested in. Um, and so we think Charlie Ergen kind of saw 5G years ahead of everybody else and he started buying Spectrum. Market didn't value the company well for a few years. Now it's finally starting to see what he's doing. Um, but so, so, so uh, I mean, it's anybody's guess. Um, I think the, the only long-term risk, I think, is really the user-based platlining for, um, you know, for Facebook. Other than that, I think, it, and I think that's why they're reinventing, right? And they're kind of reinventing the business with Meta. So, you know, it's probably cheap, um, you know, on a valuation basis. The stock isn't too expensive. And if they can make something out of it in two years, um, you know, for me, I'm just going to be watching it and then just kind of seeing who starts to win in the metaverse because it's not foregone right now. But um, so so that's an unfortunate way of saying I just don't know. I think it's a future that we don't we don't know enough yet to come up with any sort of you know high probability of of of, of knowing. The other issue on, on Facebook, Facebook Meta is now is the uh, whether they'll be able to stay in Europe intact as they're trying to do with. The uh, oh, yeah. uh, what's the regulation on private the privacy regulation? Yeah. Also, they're worried about the antitrust issues there. So there's a lot of overhang on them. And the other thing that bothers a lot of investors is their uh, voting structure not exactly on one of friends around either. So um, I think those issues are all outstanding. And there's you know, when you look inside them, though, each of their deals created a lot of value. So on a breakup, are they worth more than they are right now? It's going to be an interesting thing to see. Too. Um, so one of the things we're focused on with the big tech companies, which we think people are missing, is some of them are selling that really attractive valuations right now because their growth rates are still so high. You just look at the cloud players, and we think we're still in the third or fourth inning of cloud adoption really taking off. And yet these guys are still growing at 30% in businesses that are, you know, $750 billion businesses growing at 30%. That's, you know, it's pretty good. So, we, you know, we gotta, we got to be careful about 
going too far with the pendulum either way. There, there are a lot of headwinds for them, but these guys are buying up businesses left and right. I mean, Microsoft was $67 billion in cash. That's, that's probably bigger than I think all but about 80 companies' market cap in the S&P is the cash deal because that they're spending. So I think there's a, there's a real dynamic in the public market, so you got to be careful on is that the rich are getting richer because they can keep using their cash flows to buy up businesses and buy more advanced technologies and create a bigger gap between them and everyone else. You know, and you just look at, people don't talk much about Microsoft's five LinkedIn, but that may have been the best tech purchase in a long, in, in decades, uh, because of what they've gotten with that platform. So I think you have to look into these things a little bit more than the headlines and their multiples and really think, are they growing in the areas that are gonna drive the, the global economy forward? And we think that's being overlooked by a lot of people and when they're, kind of lumping them all together like that. So um, that element, and then the last thing I would just add is we think we're about to have a reset of how we think about the valuations on everything because of the shift in central bank policy. And even though it might not move up that high in rates, for the companies that are in the most fragile positions, this is Buffett's when the tide goes out. And we think you're about to see the tide go out on a lot of companies, which is why some of these high multiples have gotten killed but also why some of the low multiple stocks have actually continued to be very low multiple stocks. So we think that across private, public, crypto, all asset categories, you're going to have a different type of hurdle for returns that's going to make this a different environment. So I think that's one of the things that we're trying to balance off right now how we look at these guys, because it's easy to paint them all with one brush. Steve, on that point, I'm curious if anybody's feeling this. We've seen on a couple of our, actually I think, one of the investors that was looking at you, really excited, perfect investor, but they just got crushed in the public market and their portfolio, and they can't invest in the privates just now. You, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm just <laughs> curious if, if, if we're seeing sort of a drying of the, of the venture LP base a little bit. Uh, is anyone seeing that because of the uh, changes? Well, part of that is also because they got hit so hard, they're now looking to those as possible opportunities instead of a you know an eight to ten year lockup fund. So it's working both ways. Too. I think they're worried about the capital drying up for the next round. I think that's the real issue that's, that's at play when you change the the cap table, the cap rate. You have a whole different set of what the view is of future earnings, and if you're not making that adjustment now, you're going to be screwed. So. We think that that's what's slowing down all asset classes. You'll see some shifts in demand that are going to just be people going to be a little more circumspect. We think they have to be a little more circumspect right now too. There could be a lot more <coughs> of the problems that you're describing, and mm -hmm. and the you know we've seen the deals in the in the private space take a lot longer to realize now anyway, and that was when we had really free money. When you switch from really free money to less free money, it's a whole different ball game and I think that's one of the things that's going to be very hard over the next 12 months is really determining what the uh, what the change in the in the cash free rate does to valuations across all asset classes. I'm curious too, like I've seen a, I've seen a lot of favor towards private credit niches. Yeah, I mean I, I'm seeing that too. I, I, I mean I came from kind of the rates background. So I totally, totally agree with you, Stephen, that if, if, you, if you're going to start to see the rates come up a little bit, it's going to really promote, uh, present a problem for some of the companies that are not performing well on a cash flow basis, number one. So I certainly see that point. I'm not sure I completely see the point of the LP cash um, resources uh, depleting as much because of the fact the private markets have done as well as they have. I think you've got a good point and that they're going to be maybe a little bit more careful in terms of potential valuations, but there is a, a, a different, you know, there is a different model there to some extent. Um, so I think, I think folks like, you know, Cornstart and Don's platform, when you have the innovation and you have disruption and it changes the, the, the equation, I think that's going to continue to attract the resources out there in the private markets. I think it's a question of to be very careful what the outlook is. Well, I'm not saying it's not going to, they're not going to, everyone's not going to continue to attract capital. I just think the capital is going to get returns at a much different rate than 
the expectations have been. That's fair. And I think it's going to come fast, and I think it will slow down the marginal buyers. And without the marginal buyers, it creates a whole different scenario for all these assets. Fair. So, and, and the other part is for the privates, you need the, you need the next round. So you need to keep moving, and if they're not confident, because the ultimate game is to, you know, either get the big strategic buyer or go public, then the valuations change, the return opportunities change, no and then people have a whole different view of what's risk-free. You know, I would never object to anything yeah. you're saying. No, you can fully <laughs> object. I, I respect your work. I make it up most of the time, but I do think <laughs> this is one that I, I don't think people are is focused on it because they think everything's just going to keep going on. Right. And we think we may be coming to one of those points where everything changes. And and it changes the thought process because we've been so long with free money. Yes, no question. And exceptionally free money. So, so that, that's true for public, private markets. But how does that stand to the Web3 economy or crypto? Like, obviously, it's been hit hard. It's down 30%. Year, but I, I think it's a reflection. Of, I think that what you just said is a reflection that it it matters everywhere. That all all boats rose because you had free money, mm -hmm. and when you make the money less free, the re return expectations automatically go up, and therefore people are going to require a higher rate of return. And I don't know how you get much higher rates of return on some of the things we've had. So I think we're just in one of those periods where you have to have an expectations reset that will get you back on track for a more normal kind of fundamentally based economy uh, as opposed to an artificially supported one that we've had massive support from governments around the world. So I think that change is, is where we're just underway in the developed countries. Last year we had it all in the, in the emerging economies and you saw what the results were. And so I think we're going to catch up with the rest of the world that's going to bring the return expectations down and then how much risk you're willing to take for how many years to get those returns. I think we're just moving to a different paradigm that's going to require people to think differently about it. So when you talk about your reset, I, I thought about expected inflation versus actual mm -hmm. similar dynamic. Yep. But I do think that that's more of a, you know, the macro cycles and the kind of technical <coughs> of asset class, you know, for, I would say VCC fund is the, is the most insulated from that type of dynamic. Because if you look at a company like Adela, which we got in when it was, you know, almost nothing. It now has more than 100 million of revenue. Now, sure, markets might be 30% off or whatever, but that's okay. You went from zero in revenue to 100 million in revenue. You've created a ton of value, and you'll get rewarded for that value. You know, my first venture fund has a 50% IRR, and I see that just going up because of the disruption that's happening in the education space. And so the speed area is probably the most insulated from these bigger macro trends simply because we're making judgments and bets on companies that are going from zero to a hundred million and it doesn't matter what the macro is doing once you do that you've created a ton of value if a company is going from zero to a hundred million you're right the the <laughs> environment liquidity won't matter but it's for the ones that aren't doing yeah. that which yeah. are or the bulk of the ones that are invested in. Yeah. So I think yeah. that it's, it's that issue. It's yeah. not the ones that work. It's the ones yeah. that don't. But, it's the, the but it's the seed phase. phase. If you get a good investor in the seed phase across the entire class, I'm yeah. making the argument across the entire class of seed cap venture capital investing, that's more insulated. Yeah. Than that because it's all yeah. in the idiosyncratic risk. Yeah. On, a, on a portfolio basis. Yeah. 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 But if the whole world's Resetting, I don't think it really matters at that point. The, and all the valuations are going to be reset. It can be insulated, so it's less of a reset, but it's still going to be reset in our view because you can't change the whole cap, the cap rate structure and think it's right. not going to impact all assets. Yeah, no, I think it'll actually help the C class because my prices will go from 10 million as an initial investment down to 3 million as an initial investment, and my returns will look better because they're still going if from you, zero to 100. Million. If you come to Ohio, yeah. that's right. Especially if those seed funds are in Ohio. Do <laughs> you have another question, Wanda? You had a three parter? Okay. Any other questions from those on Zoom? I know Jim Hawk had a, had a question for you uh, about that he's left. Um, oh, I think we, our Zoom has shrunk. But uh, the question was uh, uh, the Indian game of Cajun company. What was the name? Azara. 
Nazar. They went public. N A Z A R. N A Z A R. Okay. Stephen, did Stephen Jones, you were asking about tigers. Um, did you have an? You're still there. Do you want? Do you have an opinion on how you uh, differentiate, or how would you prepare? You can, or is it not not an or? Uh, what do you mean? Like us versus? Stephen Jones, do you want to maybe re restate your question? Uh, sure. Yeah, this is a fund that's out. Um, has been raising money for I think about uh, four months. Um, it's pretty much invested at this point. And for whatever reason, they went to JP Morgan and now Morgan Stanley to raise money. Um, primarily, you know, it's, it's Tiger Global. So it's their primarily, you know, uh, early round investing, I guess, you know, round A, um, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I, I think you touched on some of, I guess, what I'm weighing. Does it, 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 you know, you could say values are down and they've actually written it 20% from, you know, whatever, the last six months in terms of maybe company values. But does that trickle through to, you know, kind of the, the, the early rounds or does it not, is it just noise because you're really hunting for, the 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 uh, unicorns and the unicorns you know are going to be unaffected by a twenty percent reset. So you know, go ahead and invest, and um, you know, d disregard the noise and um, you know, focus on the longer play. Um, so it, it it sort of crosses over some of the comments that have been made, and you know, I'm curious if anybody has any opinion on that uh, or if anyone else is, happens to be looking at it. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll pause there. Hopefully that uh, makes some sense. I'll just make a quick comment on the VC asset class. So what does get affected is that, you know, the, the barbell has been go put money in a pre IPO later stage stuff. So, so what's been, what's been happening is a lot of money has gone into companies right before they go IPO. And and you know they're expecting a big a big pop. Yep. And what's going to happen when you get that twenty percent correction or thirty percent correction is those funds and those investments will not perform as well. But yes, the early stage will not be affected by that still. But you have to be ready for the longer game. You know, it's a five to ten year game as opposed to a two or three year pop with your money. So if you want exit value and liquidity, you know, playing that other end of the barbell will get affected in the VC space. The late stage growth. Um, right before IPO, that'll be, I think, effective. For sure. and, and look, I would say it's this, it, it's a very, very smart group of people. It's an amazing process, right? You're not going to go wrong with, with Tiger from that perspective. I feel like I learned a lot um, when I was when I was sort of in, in the building. Um, I would say it's so big, though, that, right, you're making a bet on um, – you're basically making that exact bet. You're making a bet on the cross section of all of these potential unicorns and their valuations in a few years, right? You're not, you know, doing what uh, uh, you know 361 we did with with, with Ohio and, and and Jack, where you are, you know, finding these small kind of companies where you know we're a lot more nimble. But you know, again, that said, you're investing with the smartest people in the world, I think, uh, for what that's worth. If you, if you look at what Tiger Global has done in the last decade, if you look, I think a pitch book there was a chart how they started investing in early stage companies. It, like you would think companies sitting here, they were competing with deal flow with Squares of the world in India, but Square had like a five year head start. They're investing in more mm -hmm. deals in India and the return is much higher. Mm -hmm. A lot of their company in India has IPO'd that they invested earlier. So you look at India had 40 unicorns. They were involved with almost 25, 26 of those companies. So this, it is a process-driven organization. You mm -hmm. can't compare, you know, your money to Tiger's money unless you're giving them money. It's a different scenario. Tough, I mean, tough Tiger, to get into Tiger. Tough, 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 tough <laughs> to get into Tiger. They have $21 billion. Right. SoftBank put together $100 billion, and, you know, we know what happened. There is a process-driven organization, and fundamentally, they have proven that thesis out that these are the companies that we want to get in, and this is how we're looking at it. We're not going to give somebody a blank check, and that they got Tiger and the rest of the world. You know, they're different from 
squares of the world, they're in a totally different class. If you look at how many unicorns they're in, just look at these things. Mm -hmm. Look at these companies. Somewhere in Africa, somewhere in Mozambique, where who would I wouldn't <laughs> think about investing. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Thank you. Any other, uh, that's good color. Thank you. Is there a, a, a tech angle to cannabis? Since someone brought up cannabis, I'm curious if people are still on the phone and is that, I guess it's more science. So yeah. you probably don't don't include it as tech, but I'm, I'm curious, I'll just throw it out there. Know. I mean, there's, there's, all, there's different kinds of tech. Um, we, we, we have a fund that does tech and cannabis, for example, L2 Ventures. Um, we all got in on the weed mat, well not we all, but some of us got in on the weed mat secondary, which we haven't really talked about secondaries here. Um, if, you can, if you can get an 80% discount on something and give a good shot. Um, and then we talked about, actually we haven't talked about SPACs, right? We got all these blank check SPACs that may not, maybe with some return capital. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some te tech, it sounds like someone else wanted to talk about tech and cannabis. I just wanted to make a comment. So I, I, in New Jersey, New York, what happened was they were selling merchandise like T-shirts, and these T-shirts were very, very expensive. Then in the return, they were giving you one ounce of marijuana in return. So wait, you, wait, wait, wait. Say this one more time. This was, this, so this was interesting. You know, obviously, you can't sell legally, right? It's, it, it, you have to read in between the laws. And this was in the news. I think it was at uh, 1010 or, or CNN, or I, I read it somewhere. Okay. $100 okay. you sure get <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So they were like, you couldn't, legally you can't sell, but you can transport in terms of boundaries. So what they were, you, you can buy merchandise from them. In exchange, they were giving you these marijuana for gift. So New Jersey and New York, these regulators came very harsh and like cut it down. They didn't find anybody. But just to, this is this just happened recently, like with the next last three, four days. Be a happy meal. Now it's a t-shirt <laughs> with a dime bag. I'm not sure that addressed your question, Steve, but it is an interesting fact. Interesting fact. <laughs> it was more interesting, my question, so I, I thank you. <laughs> Everybody wants to know the name of that. I, I won't take the credit. <laughs> um, other, other points on testing and tech? By the way, you have an order. Anything else on tech uh, on the phone, uh, uh, Tanya or Barry? Okay, uh, it's, it's Barry here. Um, you know, one of the things that the discussion hasn't really focused on is the difference between, um, I, I'll just say it, new, new tech and applied tech. And those are vastly two different investment opportunities. So, um, by, new, by, new, by new tech, do you mean deep tech, or what, what do you? Well, you define well, we more? Do, we can call it deep tech, but you know, um, just um, new technology discoveries. So it's it's hasn't been available yet, and there's a new technology that's developed that will do, I don't know, um, X Y Z, and and then you know, five years later you find a lot of applications for um, the technology and you find 50 companies using the applied technologies, right? Um, so uh, I just, you know, the, the new technology is probably a riskier bet and the applied technologies are more betting on adoption cash flows, not adoption rates, but cash flows, right? So anyway, right. just a thought. No, it's, we, we in London, of London in 2019, we had this discussion between Zach Nasser and Akshay Kiran. Um, one was on, I think Zach was more applied, Akshay was more fundamental, I couldn't, I couldn't see Zach, I can't remember, but um, you know, we, we, we were going to a lot of universities in the Midwest, this, this whole commercialization uh, discussion. and. And some families are all about, you know, funding PhD um, research and um, and taking the long. It's a long game. Um, uh, your friend um, Byron Allsberg uh, did a presentation in December on deep tech. He thinks this is the time. This is like 
for, for deep tech. I just came from Ohio where Intel's putting a 20 to $100 billion plant and they're, they're putting $100 million plus into research uh, as part of their contributing universities. Um, and uh, it's going to be really, you know, it's going to be an interesting stimulant um, there. But anyone have a comment on? I, and we are going to Ann Arbor for for the tech transfer part on uh, May 5th. If I haven't told everybody, it's May, April 30th, Buffett, Omaha. Uh, we'll do a reception that evening. Next morning, we're gonna then we're gonna basically drive to Chicago. How? We're gonna go through Des Moines. How long is that trip? <laughs> it's six and a half hours, but we're, we're we're cutting it up. We're doing Des Moines. Then we're going to uh, Augustana College, where they have a, 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 I'm trying to find the application, but it's a prisoner education program that Eric Lindbergh has been funding. And they, the prisoners don't always have access to tech. Um, and then we go race car driving in Joliet. So we all have <laughs> half day, like, and, and like we learn, get either with a with driver, without. So it's like a fun build, you know, building, uh, let's say team building in a way, 361 team building. <laughs> And then we go to Chicago, and then we go to the South Side. We're going to try to do a demo day in the South Side of Chicago, and then come into the Loop uh, with Winston Strawn, and then do an impact conference. And then we get out of there and to Ann Arbor for the evening, and then uh, have an, an, like a day of tech transfer, which is that to your part of, to your point. They're going to showcase their best babies that are coming out of you know billions uh, have been spent there. So it's going to be. Interesting, uh, how we can all connect to that. But any, if anyone wants to com comment on Mark, deep tech, yeah. Mark, when is that? So that's uh, April 30th is the Buffett's meeting at Berkshire Hathaway in Omaha. And oh, at Wanda, I'm, I've been running with this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, quick it was her idea. Uh, and I already booked my hotel, and the mm -hmm. reason for that is the prices are skyrocketing, uh -oh. even oh. right now. So my recommendation uh, is the meeting will be in downtown Omaha, on the other side of Missouri. Uh, the hotels are cheaper, mm -hmm. so I gladly share, you know, where I booked, there are other investors already there. Mm -hmm. um, so in the spirit of Warren Buffett, um, the fragility, or however you want to call it, my hotel uh, tonight is in Western Inn at 180, and downtown is 700. Mm -hmm. So you may want to compare that. You add to that the cost of the car, but for those who are thinking about attending the meeting, I highly recommend Dan Slang, which is not my forte. <laughs> Can you just but write this in a, a little note and yes, then I'll, I'll, I'll and circulate it? I will it. gladly share it. Yeah. Um,